Good day and welcome to the Overcoming the Difficulties of Mandated Electronic Lot Distribution Reports Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. You may ask a web question at any time throughout the program via the Q&A panel. Simply type your question in the Q&A box provided, then use the drop-down arrow to, to select All Panelists before selecting the Send button. The Q&A panel can be located along the right column of your screen, or if you are in full screen mode, you will find it in the floating menu bar at the top of your screen. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Ben McGinty, Senior Director, Life Sciences. Please go ahead. Hello, and good morning, good evening, or good afternoon. Uh, noticing from most of the attendees that we do have people participating from uh, quite some distance from here in the, in the uh, Philadelphia area. So uh, thank you for joining, and uh, we're excited to have the opportunity to share with you some of the uh, the new requirements for um, lot distribution data and lot distribution reporting requirements uh, to the FDA. Uh, again, my name is Ben McGinty, and I'm going to provide just a brief overview of, of REIT technology and what our uh, service offerings are, and then I'm going to turn it over to John Lawrence, who's going to uh, go more into the details of the specific requirements of creating and submitting your lot di distribution data to the FDA. So um, just a brief agenda, and I, I trust that everyone can see our slides. Um, again, I'll pro provide a brief overview of REIT technology and our company profile. Uh, and then John is going to go ahead and um, go over the specific submission requirements, uh, some of the lessons learned in, in our participation of the pilot program um, what it will take to prepare content for a manufacturer's uh, data submission, and then what Read Tech's lot distribution reporting solution actually looks like. Um, at the conclusion of our presentation, uh, we'll certainly open it up for Q&A as previously ref uh, referenced. And um, just for those that are wondering, we will have provide the slides to everyone, we'll be delivering those slides to all the registered attendees, as well as uh, uh, providing them through our uh, website here at Read Technology. So uh, I'll just go right into a brief company overview. Uh, Read Technology is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Read Elsevier, and um, we're part of the LexisNexis family. So we report in through LexisNexis and are part of the Reed Elsevier group. Um, we have over 900 employees, mostly located here in the um, Philadelphia suburban area. However, we do have uh, several. We have a, uh, a facility in the Alexandria, Virginia area, as well as in uh, the Netherlands. So uh, our primary or largest business base is consist of work that we do for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. We've been processing uh, U.S. patents for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office since 1970. So if, uh, if your company has had a patent submitted, we've actually uh, processed it for the pre-grant publication as well as the granted patent uh, distribution. Um, in addition to that, we have an intellectual property commercial um, services business, and in, um, let me see, uh, 2005, we started supporting life sciences services primarily for structured product labeling for um, drug content of labeling submissions, and uh, eventually led into some other services, which I'll talk about briefly. So our primary focus in the life sciences pharma business has been basically creating content um, in structured product labeling format. So prior to 2005, um, all content submitted to the FDA was either in paper or primarily in, in PDF format. And in 2005, drug listing uh, information, actually just content of labeling at that point, was then required to be submitted in structured product labeling uh, XML uh, content format specific to the um, schema requirements of the FDA's uh, SPL uh, requirements. 
since then, we've, we've broadened our services. We now support uh, several hundred customers uh, as small as a one, one label company with one product up to uh, some of the largest uh, drug manufacturers in the world. And we represent over uh, 70 companies uh, that are located throughout, uh, throughout the world. So anyone that's doing a drug listing or labeling submission or registering an establishment or requesting a labeler code uh, in the United States or marketing a product in the United States, uh, we actually do provide the service to create the SPL submission and do the drug uh, establishment registration, uh, company registration and drug listing here in the United States. We've been uh, rather robust <laughs> in uh, learning all the ins and outs of SPL and its nuances. Uh, we've created tens of thousands of submissions to the FDA, and uh, we've actually learned that there's a lot of peculiar nuances with those submissions. Um, and so this next phase of lot distribution reporting in structured product labeling, extensible markup language format, just seemed to be um, a related service that we could offer some of our customers and anyone else who's, who's not familiar with SPL requirements. So we do, um, we do submit a lot of uh, submissions through the ESG gateway, and of course the only way you can submit to the FDA uh, electronically is through their electronic submissions gateway. And about half of our customers uh, utilize our service to submit on their behalf, and then the other half uh, basically do it through their own ECG, ESG gateway. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, last year, the FDA moved to a new requirement for medical device submissions. So they're creating a global unique device identification database that's uh, all medical device products that are marketed in the United States. And so... Again, in order to submit bulk medical device good ID information, you need to submit it through the electronic submissions gateway, and it needs to be in structured product labeling format uh, data sets. And so as a parallel to our life sciences business, we're now also supporting uh, good ID submissions to the FDA on behalf of our clients that are uh, medical device manufacturers uh, for those medical device products that are marketed in the United States. Um, and in addition to that, we plan to continue to support uh, medical device submissions throughout the world as unique device identification criteria expand um, to other um, global regulatory agencies who are also looking at implementing that requirement. Um, so that's a brief background of Reed Technology and what services we offer in the life sciences uh, market sector. And at this point now, I'd like to turn it over to John Lawrence, who's going to talk more specifically about the lot distribution submission requirements. All right. Thank you, Ben. And thank You're you, welcome. everyone who's on the call today for joining us for the lot distri uh, distribution reporting discussion. First, some background I'd like to cover on the FDA's uh, Lot Distribution Reporting Initiative. You may hear me say LDR a few times uh, uh, through the webinar. That's the, the term that we've been uh, utilizing in our speak here at Reed Tech, so uh, just to ensure we're all on the same page. So for uh, starting off with the FDA's motivation for electronic uh, uh, lot distribution reporting, uh, the FDA st stated that they would like improved data file format providing a standardized and consistent presentation of lot distribution information that can be automatically transferred and validated against the FDA's regulatory management system, which tracks licensed FDA products and manufacturers. Uh, previously, as you know, this information was being uh, uh, not submitted electronically, so there was limitations to how the FDA could use the data. So this all ties in together with the initiatives that we've been experiencing in the last uh, about 10 years now as Ben mentioned, getting into electronic uh, drug labeling and then product listing. The FDA is asking for more of this information to be submitted electronically so they can better manage it on their end for safety and surveillance reasons. 
some FCA LDR documentation that's available. Uh, first, there is the final rule, which was published on June 10th of 2014. I will provide a link uh, to the slide here. I do want to mention that we will be providing these slides uh, out to all attendees. I believe we'll be sending a link to download the slides so uh, you'll be able to access the links that are embedded in this deck uh, when the slides are provided to you. Uh, next, we have the Code of Federal Regulations for the LDR subsection. Uh, this essentially uh, covers the information requirements for distribution reports. Uh, so that's uh, general requirements, not getting into specifically the electronic requirements. Uh, the next document would be the final guidance for industry, which now gets into the detail of electronic submissions of those lot distribution reports. Uh, finally, the document that uh, ReadTech is always most interested in is the technical specifications, uh, specifically the SPL implementation guide with validation procedures. Uh, this document uh, contains all of the, the instructions for building the SPL files that are submitted to the FDA, uh, covering those labeler code requests, establishment registrations, and product listing and labeling submissions that Ben referred to earlier. So this document has all that information and now has been updated to include lot distribution reporting uh, uh, requirements uh, as well. The summary of of this information again with uh, the applicable contents. Uh, so what we're looking at is uh, the final rule document, as you can see on the right, uh, the right column of this table is referencing a document and then we're, we're basically describing uh, what the contents you can expect within each. Uh, the final rule essentially covers the scope and that uh, being the biologic products approved under BLA regulated by Seaver and Cedar. It will also cover uh, the distributed product quantity for reporting period, so how uh, frequently you have to uh, make these submissions, and also the, the start date of uh, the, the mandate. So uh, that, that date, as you are assumingly all aware, was June 10th of 2015, essentially one year after the publication of the final rule. So that date has come and, and passed, so now we're in the period of mandated electronic lot distribution reporting. Um, and again, as, as I mentioned, the frequency of those submissions. Uh, the guidance for industry document, that's the acronym GFI that you see on, on the right-hand side. That document will get into describing the file format, uh, the file format being SPL XML. Uh, the submission and transmission instructions, uh, as we'll get into in a little bit, this submission uh, does have to uh, be made as part of your ECTD Submission. So it's essentially going in Module 3, Section 3.2.R with the regional information of your ECTD. And then, of course, that ECTD has to be submitted electronically via the Electronic Submissions Gateway. But lastly, the final rule does have uh, provisions for a waiver, as I believe all of these uh, uh, final rules do. Um, and the FDA gives instructions for submitting a waiver where you would have to uh, justify why uh, your organization cannot meet this requirement uh, within the timelines that the FDA provided. So if you feel like you apply uh, uh, to that type of scenario, uh, please see the final rule for instructions in submitting that waiver. Now what I would like to cover is some, some information that we are able to um, uh, ex obtain while participating in the FDA's pilot program for submitting SPL files for lot distribution reporting. Uh, we were lucky enough to be approached by the FDA uh, in December of last year, maybe it was late November, uh, because as Ben mentioned, we're a very large submitter through the Electronic Submissions Gateway. Uh, so the, the FDA approached us to see if we would be interested in participating in, in a pilot program, uh, essentially an end-to-end -end pro pilot program related to submitting these SPL files uh, for one, SPL validation, and two, also to ensure the FDA can receive the information and decrypt the package and load it into their systems. So we obviously said yes, and we uh, signed up for that pilot. As mentioned, the overall strategy was that end-to-end -end testing of the creation, validation, and submission of this information. The FDA put together a two-phase uh, approach to this pilot, two days, uh, two phases. 
Day one would be a submission of 10 valid scenario SPL LDR files. So what they wanted here really was realistic data that you uh, may have submitted in the past, but now uh, formatted and including the additional data as per the new requirements. And day two, they're looking for a submission of 10 invalid scenario SPL files. So this is not only uh, files that would fail the validation rules in the implementation guide, such as a 10-digit DUNS number, but it's also information that uh, maybe is just incorrect from a content standpoint. The FDA wanted to test their systems to see uh, how they were capt capturing any errors, both from a, a technical or a content perspective. There are multiple rounds of this pilot activity. As I mentioned, uh, started off in December, December 9th and 10th of 2014. Uh, then there is another round uh, in the spring in March 26th and 27th, there is another uh, two days of testing. Again, the first day being the positive scenarios and the second day being the invalid scenarios. Um, however, on, in March, the second day was canceled because we found so many um, uh, issues in day one, if you will, where uh, positive data was being submitted, but the uh, FDA system was uh, flagging validation errors. So we decided to cancel that second day, or the FDA decided to postpone that, and we resumed testing in April. So then in April 21st and 22nd, we again did the positive and negative scenario testing. I believe the FDA uh, envisioned that testing as an overall success generally. So then on May 14th, there was a final uh, round of testing uh, with, with the group that was in place. Uh, within this group, there were six manufacturers. Uh, initially, however, in, in December, ReadTech was an independent participant in that round. Uh, so we, at that time, all we had was our fictitious information. Obviously, we're not a drug company, so we don't have real um, uh, lock distribution data to report, so we had to kind of mock up some data. But then later, in the later rounds, we uh, collaborated with three manufacturers for those, for those submissions, so then we were able to use real-life information and effectively give some better testing to the FDA. Within that December round, here's, or actually, let me back up a bit. Uh, on this slide, I just do want to point out some experiences that we had in this pilot. And it, they did vary as the different rounds uh, took place, as, as things got uh, more mature within the FDA's process and, and our own. So in December, as I mentioned, uh, we used, utilized that fictitious data. So all we really were able to achieve that we could build the, X, uh, the SPL XML uh, successfully and um, any of the errors that we received were due to that fictitious data. Uh, because there is a daily med cross-check that the FDA put in place as part of the validation procedures. So for example, the NDA, or I'm sorry, the BLA numbers that we utilized in our, in our submission data were not real BLA application numbers, so that caused a validation error. However, we were able to, uh, quote, validate the way that we build the XML as being uh, acceptable to the FDA. Now, moving into March, when we started collaborating with some other, uh, with some real manufacturers, uh, we were able to use real-life data. So on day one, uh, and submitting that data, very few records passed the validation. Uh, a lot of those records were failing due to erroneously triggered product listing validation procedures. So, uh, as I mentioned, the FDA is cross-referencing this data to uh, the information in their listing database, ultimately the information that you have on daily med, and uh, some of the validation procedures they were calling during this time uh, were not supposed to be called for a lot distribution reporting submission. An example would be uh, the requiring product characteristics for a solid oral dosage form. Well, that information is already in the listing database, and the validation procedure and implementation guide states that that's not required for the submission type. So those types of things were happening in um, day one of the March round, and that's why it was decided to just postpone day two's testing and have some updates performed, I believe, on the FDA's end to uh, no longer call those validation procedures which were not applicable. So once that was uh, uh, corrected, it was coordinated in April round for resubmission of those records that were submitted in March in the day one pilot. This time around in day one, the majority of those SPL records passed validation. However, there's still a few data issues remaining. 
um, again, mostly for the cross-validation of what was pr uh, listed uh, within your product listing submission. However, we, we did proceed with day two with the invalid uh, uh, testing scenario, and that was complete. Um, the results were being determined by the FDA, and uh, we were able to uh, ensure that inspected errors were received. Uh, the last round was May 2015, which was actually just a submission within the ECTD format itself. The previous uh, submissions were made independent SPL submissions. They were not packaged within Module 3. Uh, that capability was not in place for the earlier uh, rounds, but it became in place in May. And we were successfully able to demonstrate that, uh, that the FDA was able to receive the submission within the ECTD and extract and process the file. So some, again, lessons learned and general observations. Uh, there are inconsistencies within some of the resources available uh, with respect to how to build these files, how to build uh, the SPL file and validate the file. Uh, there's various resources, the implementation guide, which we provided that link earlier in the slide. Uh, there's the XForms tool, which the FDA provides mostly as a training tool to, if the FDA is ever uh, performing training or giving a webinar, they use that to illustrate some of the data. Uh, and also the pragmatic validator, which uh, again, that, that's utilized to uh, validate one SPL file at a time. It's a free online tool that uh, uh, the FDA has a contractor create. So essentially when we are creating these SPL files and learning how to build the SPL within this new, uh, with this new content, well, we'd reference these files. And, and obviously there were some inconsistencies observed which uh, we provided that feedback during the pilot. As mentioned previously, the ESG submission process was not set up to receive the submissions within module three for the majority of the pilot. But then in the middle of May, that capability was now introduced at the FDA. Uh, there were some issues for some submitters uh, where the, the file was not being extracted properly. But I do know, at least for experience from one of our, uh, one of the manufacturers we collaborated with, that they were able to have the ECTD extracted and the file identified, uh, identified and loaded in the FDA system. Uh, now I'd just cover some common data issues that we did encounter during the pilot. In the previous slide, I mentioned that um, most SPLs passed validation, but there were some data issues. So here's specifically of what they were. Uh, the licensed product manufacturer DUNS number. Uh, this is a new field being collected in the submission. Typically, whenever the FDA uh, uh, changes to an electronic format, you notice that they begin requesting new information that was not requested in the past in the paper world. Uh, one of these new fields has uh, always uh, consistently been the DUNS number. So the DUNS, DUNS numbers are in this submission, so if you're used to those in your other SPL submissions, uh, you'd be happy to know they're, they're here and proud again in lot distribution reporting submissions. So we ran into those DUNS numbers not matching, the DUNS number provided for a licensed product manufacturer, not matching the labeler DUNS number associated with the product listed uh, within your product listing SPL. Uh, this wasn't apparent as a requirement um, that the licensed product manufacturer and the labeler DUNS number had to match, but this is something that we learned uh, during that pilot. And it was valuable to know so we could help guide our, our, our clients in, in providing the proper information. Uh, we had uh, bulk lot manufacturer DUNS numbers not being associated with an establishment registration with that same DUNS number. So again, if you're familiar with product listing requirements, whenever you're listing a product, you identify establishments associated with the manufacturing analysis or testing of that product, and you conclude that in your SPL. Uh, you may know that the FDA then cross-validates that establishment information, both the DUNS number and business operations that you include, with their establishment registration database, the Decker site, that we, that's another acronym we have there. Uh, so the same is true for lot distribution reporting. Any of these uh, bulk lot manufacturers that you're supplying in the submission are going to be cross-validated against that database. So if your bulk lot manufacturer's uh, established registration is not up to date, uh, you will experience issues with your submission. It will fail validation. Uh, we had uh, some issues with the same NDC product code appearing in multiple SPL lot distribution reports. 
uh, with different set IDs. So uh, there is that history and that, that life cycle management requirement that's, again, similar to the SPL product listing. That's also true for your lot distribution reports. So once you go to SPL, you're taking some of these new requirements with you that you have to be aware of when, when uh, migrating into electronic format. Um, this, main, this is our uh, biggest issue, number four. Uh, the label lot not being specified elsewhere in the lot distribution report uh, for kit products. Uh, this is something that is, continues to be open to this day where certain kit product types are receiving this validation error. Uh, however, there's not clear information within the implementation guide and validation procedures on how to handle it. Um, however, uh, this was unable to be resolved during the pilot and, uh, and, and the, the companies we work with, uh, some of them have products applicable to, that this applies to, so it's a very important issue. However, we have been in contact with the FDA independent of the pilot and uh, having some discussions with them and have been troubleshooting this issue that we hope to have a re resolution in place uh, soon. So this is an issue that applies to all industry uh, would have these types of kit products. It's not something that um, is currently unknown how to support at this time, but again, uh, we've been working with the FDA actively on this and, and hope to have this resolved shortly. Um, lastly, uh, an error associated with variable dosing specification. This also is something that the FDA is still looking into. Uh, uh, the, the FDA did state at a recent SPL uh, leadership team meeting last Thursday, I believe, that they're looking into this feedback, both these two issues uh, discussed and maybe some other things which we are unaware of at the moment, and they're gonna be reviewing and perhaps updating the implementation guide and validation procedures. So uh, we'll be on the lookout for an updated document and be assessing any changes uh, once that does occur. Uh, lastly, as I mentioned with the erroneously triggered validation procedures, this is essentially, uh, again, the product listing validation rules, which there's quite a few. Uh, some of those were being triggered for the lot distribution report. So the FDA simply had to turn these off for this uh, particular submission type. Now I'd like to talk about uh, manufacturers uh, planning or prepping to submit the electronic lot distribution report files. We see this as a 10-step as a plan, both uh, from preparation uh, prior to your uh, submission of the information, and then also obviously when you move into production. Um, again, this is a uh, requirement that is was mandated um, a few weeks ago, so we, we have to start uh, moving on this quickly. Uh, first, we, we see it's valuable to create a governance team. The previous submissions, uh, obviously there was owners of those submissions uh, at your respective companies who uh, submitted this information previously, uh, but now with the electronic formats, uh, the team that's uh, responsible for the information may need, to, may need to expand into your submissions group that handles the ECTD submissions, uh, or perhaps uh, some technical support for creating these SPL files. So uh, sure to get that team together, identify the right people who, who are going to work on this uh, at your organization. Uh, then to research and identify those requirements for your products. Uh, again, we're providing these slides that have the links to those documents, but take a look at the information being required, uh, because as I mentioned, it may be some new information you're not, uh, you were not submitting in the past. Uh, third, to evaluate, select, and implement an LDR solution. You know, again, this is, this is now mandated, so time is of the essence, but uh, depending on when your uh, submission frequency was taking place, uh, you know, it'll be time to, to evaluate how you are going to respond to this. Uh, confirming your ECTD uh, system, again, since all of these files have to be made in Module 3 of the ECTD, uh, you have to reach out to that group who is making ECTD submissions for other reasons uh, to coordinate with them uh, and ensure that they're aware that these submissions now have to go through that channel. Uh, lastly, to create and confirm an FDA ESG account if you do not have one already. Um, and you can advise the FDA LDD lot distribution data, electronic submissions coordinator, uh, that you're ready to make submissions. They want to be aware before, they want a heads up, if you will, before you start submitting. Uh, and as I understand it, they 
uh, are still entertaining test submissions if you wanted to make some test submissions prior to going live in production. Um, again, we coordinate, coordinate with the FDA submission coordinator uh, on that topic, and hopefully uh, you'd be able to perform some tests to get the warm and fuzzy before you roll over to production. Once you are in production, uh, you'll have to be collecting that, that source data. So uh, again, some of this content may be new. So looking at the data that needs to be required and you'll have to gather it. Um, there's the validation of that source data. Now that we're electronic format, uh, the validation rules are obviously much more uh, challenging than a, than a paper submission. So there's things like data format requirements, controlled terminology, cross-validation to the FDA's uh, product listing database. Those are the type of things that have to be validated to ensure your submission is accepted. But then obviously once you know your data is valid, you have to build that SPL structure. And uh, then assemble that package into your ECTD and then maintain that data in the system. So there's not much that uh, uh, Reed Tech can do in the first part of this plan. I mean, it, it's the organization has to, again, put together ownership within each individual organization for uh, 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 owning this, this process and identifying a solution. However, uh, there are some good things that we believe we could help you with uh, for the second portion when, once you hit production, uh, similar to the way that we support product listing submissions and, and the other services that Ben mentioned. This essentially is just an extension to what we're already doing for structured product labeling for the label submissions and, and listings. So uh, next I'd like to go over uh, read text solution from the perspective of getting your data valid and built in the SPL format and submitted to the FDA. Yeah, John, before you move into that, uh, this has been, again, uh, one of the things I would like to mention, though, is that the people that traditionally what we're finding with a lot of our customers are that the people that traditionally had responsibility for submitting the lot distribution report uh, are not typically or at least in our experience we're finding that many of them uh, were not in the regulatory affairs department and we're not familiar with how to integrate the drug listing information with the lot distribution report so when you are preparing that data, there certainly are things that we can help with uh, to help you understand who in your organization can help you integrate the drug listing, the relevant drug, in, um, drug listing information with the lot distribution report. Mm -hmm. So when you're preparing your data, we certainly can help provide some, some guidance and support in where that data comes from, how it has to validate and reconcile with what's already out in the drug listing at the FDA to ensure that when we do submit your information that it fully validates with the FDA's uh, cross-validated uh, information data sets. Yep. Thank you, Ben. So just on that point, uh, here's a, a slide, here's a high-level overview of, of our solution. As Ben mentioned, the collection of, of the data as a first step. Great point that Ben made. Uh, these uh, folks who are responsible uh, for the submission previously may have no uh, information about the, the data being submitted as part of your product listing submissions. And if that's the case, we're absolutely able to support that uh, uh, data collection from Daily Med. Uh, similar to product listing, we offer a service to, to pre-populate some of the information uh, based on our experience of what the FDA is uh, requiring from an SPL perspective. And we could do the same with that type of information into the lot distribution report. Uh, next, there's the, the validation of the data. Uh, you know, we build an application that reads all of the FDA's uh, validation rules for the lot distribution report. Uh, so we're able to validate that data against all the FDA's lot distribution reporting business rules, as well as cross-checking that information against your product listing submission. Uh, this is to avoid any uh, discrepancy uh, cross-check validation errors that the FDA is performing. Uh, this is both uh, from a product listing perspective and, and site registration. Uh, we're able to build these SPL files, again, valid and compliant 
with the FDA's implementation guide and validation procedures and manage those SPL versions so we're ensuring that you're adhering to the life cycle management requirements of SPL submissions. Once that's complete, we'd be sending the files back to you the same manner in which that we're uh, doing today for product listing for any review and approval of that SPL and then ultimately uh, for you to submit as part of your ECTD submission. Um, the product listing submissions are made independently, so ReadTech uh, makes, uh, as Ben mentioned, many submissions on behalf of our customers. Um, but now for this, for being part of the ECTD, uh, it's, we could submit that ECTD for you. However, uh, we're not your ECTD provider uh, or your solution, so we would need either your ECTD provider or, or if it's internally at your organization, to compile that ECTD submission and either submit it um, or if, it, if, if you need support submitting it, you can pass that to ReadTech to make the submission. And then ultimately uh, that will end up in the FDA's lot of distribution database. To guide this process, uh, we developed a, a data collection form. So again, if you're familiar with working with us for product listing and other submissions, you'll be familiar with our data collection forms. Um, uh, so this one is now specific to lot distribution reporting. Uh, along with this form, we have a guide that we provide you with on explaining how to complete the form and, and what uh, format some of the data is required to be in. Uh, but then again, remember when this form comes back to us, we're going to be loading it into our application and performing validation. So if there's uh, something not filled out properly or in, in an incorrect format, our validation procedures uh, will catch that and we would uh, reach out to you to resolve any of those issues prior to moving forward with the SPL uh, conversion and submission. Uh, and we'll be able to, uh, anyone who's interested in this form, there's going to be a contact at the end of this presentation, uh, Andrew Etheridge, you can reach out to and Andrew can provide you a copy of this form and, and the guide um, as well as some more details about our service. This is a screenshot of the building application. Uh, this is internal to Read Tech, but figured we just throw it up there to show that there is actually an application. It's not smoke and mirrors, uh, but this is the tool that we're utilizing to essentially uh, validate the data and then ultimately build the SPL. So uh, our first step of validation, again, as I mentioned, as we receive the data uh, template from you, we'll validate and circle back with you if there's any issues. If not, we're just going to proceed with that SPL build and uh, we'll package that up and send it back to you for, for review and submission. Again, similar to with the product listing process, it's going to be the same flow, just with now different content for those of you familiar with it. This slide show you an example of a rendered file and also the, the, the scary XML in the background. Uh, this truly is utilizing the same schema and style sheet as product listing. So all of the information for those who are familiar with uh, XML, the processing instructions are all the same. Uh, data elements are similar, just tagging the different content. Um, and the information does actually render in the style sheet. So when we return the file back to you, uh, you don't have to worry about looking at the XML tagging. Uh, you can view it in the human readable style sheet. Uh, there is a bug in the current style sheet where the lot distribution data, as you can see here, is displaying twice for each uh, uh, lot, and that's something the FDA is aware of. They're going to be updating a, 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 or releasing an update to the style sheet to, uh, to correct this shortly. Um, some, some overall solution benefits uh, that we've identified with working with uh, uh, some companies. We feel that our, our solution is, is simple in that it's complementing the current internal processes that you have and also extending that into um, our current process that we have here at ReadTech and supporting with SPL conversion services. Uh, we, we are minimally intrusive, meaning we, we're accepting data from your existing systems. So any of the information that you already have stored uh, uh, can be transferred into the template, uh, but then we'll deliver those SPL files, again, for your assembly and your ECTD submission. Um, we'll save the time. Uh, for your staff for learning these uh, submission requirements, both for the technical validation procedures and the technical requirements for building the SPL. 
Uh, we have that covered here. Uh, as, you know, as mentioned, we've been actively working on this for quite some time and have this down. Uh, the value uh, of leveraging read tech to have the drug product data captured from your SPLLL. Getting back to Ben's earlier point, um, the folks uh, working on these submissions may not be familiar with your product listing information, um, so we, we can help in, in gathering that information and populating that for you in the template. Um, the validation of those FDA business rules and cross-check the daily med, uh, my opinion, are, are, are the greatest value. Uh, there's, there's quite a few rules that um, are related to just validating the, the format of the data, let alone the structure of the data within the submission. Uh, it's um, uh, quite a bit of work to, to perform that, that, those two tasks. And then uh, the, the building the actual SPL, again, and version management. Um, from a cost standpoint, we feel that it's, it's very effective. Um, again, built on our efficient, proven SPL process, uh, the processes that we utilize in production, we have uh, ISO certified. Um, all the employees that have been uh, trained on SPL conversion and now this new extension of the SPL format. Yeah, John, one of the things we've learned over the past uh, 10 years or so is that um, SPL is a moving target. Mm -hmm. So lot distribution reporting will start out with a specific set of submission criteria, and most likely new data fields, new data elements, and new requirements will be added over time. Uh, very similar to the way the FDA started out with content of labeling and then migrated to establishment registration and drug listing metadata requirements. So um, I think one of the services that we provide is the ability to stay on top of those ongoing um, uh, requirements as they change and, and be here to support our customers with uh, whatever new requirements come down the pike as the FDA implements more requirements into their uh, submission criteria. Yes, exactly. That, that last point of the SME uh, subject matter expertise assistance um, is critical. Um, ultimately, you know, we look to be your SPL support and this being now just a you know, another section now in that implementation guide with new requirements. Uh, we're naturally looking to support that, and and Ben hit it right on about the changes. I mentioned earlier in, in the presentation that we already heard the FDA is uh, looking to update the validation rules and implementation guide. So we absorb that for you. We'll we'll update our our software and our procedures and and anything that may apply to our data collection template instructions and form our our, our customers and what the changes are, but we're on top of, of staying on top of those changes and, and incorporating them into, into the process and your submissions. Uh, concluding the presentation, just a few items to wrap up and then we'll get into questions and answers. Uh, on this slide, as mentioned, we have Andrew Etheridge's information. So you can contact Andrew to obtain the forms, uh, new statement of work and things of that nature. He'll be happy to help you and get you set up. Uh, we have a life sciences blog that uh, some of you may not be aware of that we encourage you to sign up. Uh, go to the link uh, provided here and you can sign up, subscribe to the blog, and uh, periodically make some posts and uh, there's some valuable information that we feel that our customers are, are very much interested in. So please uh, consider signing up for that blog. And now we'll uh, move on to some questions and answers. As a reminder, you may ask a web question at any time uh, by uh, using the Q&A panel. Simply type your question in the Q&A box provided, then use the drop-down arrow to select all panelists before selecting the Send button. The Q&A panel can be located on the right column of your screen, or if you're in full screen mode, you will find it in the floating menu bar at the top of your screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, first question we received states, if we submit a test lot distribution report that has errors, will FDA help us identify the errors in their solution? Uh, the answer to this is yes. Um, it's the same FDA SPL coordinator uh, that is uh, working on the product listing submissions. So if you're familiar with Lonnie Smith at the FDA, if you're familiar with the SPL at FDA, 
.hhs.gov email account. It's that same account, same coordinator. Uh, and uh, they are, they will be working with you for, uh, uh, to resolve any errors. Obviously, if you're working with Retech on the submissions, uh, our application and processes have been designed to flag those errors up front. Uh, so we uh, ideally would be working with you actually before you even get to the FDA to resolve these types of errors. Uh, so your submission itself goes through uh, without a hitch. Another question we have is uh, what new information will be required for lot distribution reporting submissions in SPL format? Uh, well, we've seen in some of the data that we received from uh, manufacturers we worked with on the pilot and also uh, clients just sharing some historical data, uh, you see some differences in data that was submitted actually in the in the paper format or in PDF or Excel. Uh, however, some new items that are absolutely new are going to be uh, the DUNS number information for the the uh, bulk lot manufacturer and also the license holder. So again, uh, similar to product listing submissions, a DUNS number was never uh, required and once that was introduced, it kind of caused a little bit of challenges in ensuring that the right DUNS number is being utilized because the FDA validates that against the Dun & Bradstreet database to ensure the DUNS number does belong to who you say it belongs to and then also, again, cross-validating um, to the, the uh, established registration database. Another new uh, item would be uh, the dosing specification. Um, that is going to be new, newly captured information. Okay. So the, another question here is, has the FDA out, outlined how long the manufacturer has to make the electronic submission once the six month mark closes? Uh, we have not heard uh, the timing in which you need to make that submission. At least I, I am not aware of that timing. However, uh, a, a very good uh, resource uh, that I would recommend reaching out to is going to be the, the FDA's uh, submission coordinator. So from a technical perspective, uh, you reach out to the FDA SPL coordinator. That's SPL at HHS. .fda.gov. Uh, however, for more of the regulatory requirements and policy type requirements, reaching out to the FDA uh, lot distribution reporting submission coordinator uh, would be the right avenue to take. So if you do not have that um, coordinator's information, uh, please you know, feel free to uh, send it through an email and, and we'll be happy to provide you with that contact information. There was uh, a question about submitting any style sheets to the FDA with the XML. Uh, similar to the product listing submissions, that style sheet is actually hosted by the FDA um, on their web server. And we simply reference that location in the processing instructions of the XML. So it does not have to be submitted as, a as an additional file with your submission. Uh, your submission will just contain uh, a, a folder and that dot XML file, uh, and that, that's all that gets submitted to the FDA. There is a, a another question. Uh, have the fields placement within the F, SPL XML changed, or is the change primarily that instead of submitting the lot distribution data XML directly to the EC or ESG, we now add it to 3.2.R in the ECTD application. Uh, I am not entirely sure what particular change uh, is being referred to. If you want to add some more information in the chat box, if I do not answer this uh, in the way that you were hoping, please do so. Uh, however, if it's just referring to uh, the process change that we went through in the pilot, then the answer would be the, the SPL XML data element order, uh, nothing changed. Uh, it was just changing the way in which the submission was being made, where we moved from pointing to a standalone SPL file to now including it 
within module three of your ECTD submission. So hopefully that was um, uh, answers your question. Um, So there's a question about read text process being flexible to accommodate new validation requirements mandated by the FDA and specifically about those kit products. Uh, answer there is um, absolutely. Uh, as mentioned uh, in a previous slide, we put it on us to stay on top of this information, the requirements, um, and to ensure that our, that our clients have their submissions uh, successfully processed by the FDA. So anytime there's changes, we're going to be incorporating them, and if we feel they're relevant to our customer base, we send out a notification to our, our customer list. Um, so ensure that any changes that you may need to be aware of, uh, you're well informed prior to the FDA making requirement changes. Yeah, and we're also on the HL7 SPL working groups, so many times we, we hear of these uh, upcoming changes uh, long before they're publicly disseminated. I mean not publicly disseminated, but because we're on the working group, we're in discussions about those changes and understanding those requirements uh, early on in the process. So we get to um, notify our customers and implement those changes to our processes so that when the new requirement does go in, uh, get implemented, uh, we're pretty much on board and already meeting uh, the validation criteria for those new requirements. That appears to be it with all the, the questions we received. Yeah, I, I think I think there were some good questions, and um, uh, we can stand by here for another minute or a couple minutes. If we have any additional questions that come in, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, I think, as John mentioned earlier, um, our support team is here, our project coordinators and Drew, so any follow-up questions or if there were things that uh, you would like to just talk about on the phone, maybe it's easier to have a brief conversation than uh, ask a specific question. Uh, we're, we're certainly available and look forward to supporting you in any way that we can as you uh, wrestle with your next uh, uh, LDR submission, which I believe will be sometime between now and December. <laughs> Okay, with that, we'd just like to thank you for joining and uh, uh, listening to the presentation. And again, as has been mentioned, please uh, feel free to reach out with any questions you may have or uh, discussing how we can help you gathering the data and uh, making your submissions. We will also have this, uh, uh, this is a recorded session, so that if you want to share this uh, presentation with your colleagues, they will have it posted to our website and they'll be able to listen to the recorded session as well. Okay. All right, thank you very much for attending. Have a great afternoon. That concludes today's conference. We appreciate your participation.